This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. So, uh, uh, hello. Uh, I'm going <clears> to... <throat> so, let me first explain more precisely what I will try to explain. Um, so, I will try to explain the... Um, basically, the questions which I will try to ask will be um, how quantum mechanics centers in uh, gravity in the description of uh, um, different gravitational phenomena, uh, in particular black holes, and um, what is the substructure of the black holes. So if uh, black holes can have any substructure, what, what are they quantum mechanically, um, whether they, how, how light they can be, how, how small they can be, and, and this kind of stuff. Can they be produced experimentally? Um, this, this type of questions. And um, so what? Um, so I will try to do. Uh, I will try to. Okay. To, for for this, it's very important to superimpose uh, several several concepts uh, coming from uh, classical gravity, uh, quantum field theory, quantum mechanics, and then to view them from different angles. Okay. And um, so I will try to not to lose the connection between different descriptions, like quantum classical. So I will try to go all the time between uh, quantum and classical. So to, to have this understanding, what are the limits and what, what are the limits of applicability and this kind of questions, OK? And uh, how they, they can ask questions, right? It's OK, you know? I don't know what's the format. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can interrupt me anytime and ask whatever questions. If I know the answer, I tell you I know the answer. Uh, and I will tell you the answer. <laughs> If I don't know the answer, we'll figure it out together, if we can. I don't know. Um, OK, so um, let me start with the, uh, yeah, let me, let, let's agree on units that I will use. So I will use units in which uh, speed of light is 1, because I, how does this, this doesn't move. Uh, all right, this is OK. <laughs> so the speed of light will be 1, OK? Uh, because I'm a particle physicist, this is a, an extremely convenient unit because in these units we can uh, measure uh, distances uh, and uh, time scales in the same unit. So you can measure, for example, everything in light seconds or light centuries or uh, centimeters. So the dimensionality of the time and space is the same. And at the same time, dimensionality of the mass, the momentum, and the energy are also the same. However, I will keep h bar, Planck's constant, uh, uh, explicit. So I will not set it to 1, because uh, precisely this description of quantum to classical, for this description, it's very important to take h bar to 0 or to whatever. Uh, and uh, so to, to have it 1 is not very convenient. Uh, although you can manage. You can, in fact, you can do classical limits, as we'll see. In principle, you can keep h bar to be 1, but take occupation number of bosonic particles to infinity. That's another possibility. But let me for a moment keep it explicit. Then the, then the dimensionality of h bar in these units is, is mass times the length, OK? Or ti energy times the time and the same thing. OK, so then now, now let's try to first understand. So when we go to black holes and to gravity, to quantum gravity, first we, we go, we don't necessarily go, but let me go in that way, OK? Start with the classical. Uh, and, then, and then try to understand quantum in different ways, okay? How we get to quantum. Now, in classical physics, as, uh, as, as you know, the, the forces, uh, gravity is the most well-known force of nature, probably was discovered uh, first by, by humans. Um, and the reason why it was discovered first, because it has a classical limit. That's precisely why, okay? Without the classical limit, we would not discover it first. Now, um, uh, the reason why we discovered this first and why it has a classical limit is because you can have many, many gravitons together, okay? Uh, because gravitons are bosonic. So, uh, therefore, this historic fact is because gravity is mediated by a bosonic messenger, okay? Particles, uh, gravitons. So, in classical physics, gravitational force, uh, and is, as a matter of fact, any other force, also electromagnetic, is described uh, through the concept of the, fi of the field, right? So, we introduced this concept of the field. Now, what is field? Normally, we say that um, field is something that responds to classical field. It's something that responds to a source. Okay, so there must be a particular 
thing that is sourcing this particular field. Okay. So, for example, I mean, you, uh, the well-known thing is if I have a sphere of the mass uh, m and the radius r. Okay. In classical physics, in Newtonian physics, I would say that this sphere sources a gravitational field, and then this gravitational field has some influence at other probe sources that move in this field. Now, what is the influence? The influence is that in this particular case, this creates a distance r, which is larger than this, the size of an object. This creates some kind of a potential difference. In other words, a location-dependent potential, right? Potential energy. So this is the, the, the source, this mass m. And I can have some probe mass at some distance r. And we have Newtonian potential, right? So this is the way the field influences the, the, the probes. And from here, automatically, you get one, use this famous 1 over r square law and this kind of stuff, right? Now, uh, now if you, here already you, you can have a first encounter to black holes, in fact. In fact, this was noticed already by Laplace and also by somebody else I forgot, uh, more or less at the same time, um, that, um, so from this potential it's obvious that if you make your source more compact, okay, the same mass but more compact, the escape velocity from the surface increases, okay? Eventually you will hit the point where the escape velocity becomes equal to the speed of light, okay? At that point, you are dealing with a source which is a black hole, okay? So at that point, it's a black hole. Now, there is this magic radius, okay, which we call a Schwarzschild or gravitational radius, and which is 2 times G Newton times the mass of the source, okay? Uh, and this is the uh, physical meaning of this Schwarzschild radius. Basically, the way you can understand it is that this is the radius to which you have to uh, comp compress any given source without changing its energy so that it becomes a black hole. Okay, so this is of course a classical notion. Now this radius is a classical radius. What does it mean? It means that um, nothing happens with this radius if you take a classical limit. If I take h bar to zero, this radius just stays there. Okay, it's a classical quantity. There is no h bar dependence on this radius. Okay, fine. Now uh, the um, what do we want to understand. So now there is a one step more, right? When we go from classical Newtonian gravity to general relativity. General relativity is telling us that this field that think you, call, you classically is some kind of continuous substance, okay, it's everywhere, defined at every point of space-time, now becomes a geometry. Why? Because it responds to the sources in such a way that it curves space-time. So in other words, the, the gravitational field, the Newtonian gravitational field in Einstein's description becomes a component of a dynamical metric, okay? So Einstein's theory of general theory of relativity is a theory of a dynamical metric, literally, okay? So now we have a field which is slightly more complicated because it has more, many more components. It also captures the story in non-relativistic approximation, okay? And um, um, so this field responds to the Sources. Now, sources are anything that carries energy and the momentum, okay? So in other words, the, the energy momentum tensor. The energy momentum tensor is a source for this guy, okay? So now this is the field. Now, now the question is, how does this field respond uh, to the sources? This microphone is very heavy, I don't know. This, uh, so how does this field respond to the sources, okay? Now, um, so for this, it is useful to understand the dynamics of this field. Sometimes we split the domains of gravity into what do we call a weak field and a strong field, okay? Sometimes we do it high curvature and low curvature and so on, okay? Now, uh, let, let's go to the weak field description, okay? So what does it mean to, to go in the weak field description? Let's say I want to explore, let's say I'm an observer. I have some test sources, okay? I can measure tidal forces, I can measure accelerations and this kind of stuff. I'm an observer and I want to explore a source of some mass m, let's say the Earth. And I'm an observer and I want to explore gravitational field of the Earth, okay? Now, of course, I have to I investigate a metric, properties of the metric. I want to understand how Earth uh, how the, the, how metric responds to the gravitation to the energy momentum tensor of the Earth, okay? But there is a complication. 
what, what is the complication? The complication is that the G mu nu is a reference dependent object. It's not invariant. It's not gauge invariant, okay? We are also not gauge invariant, by the way, but that's perfectly fine not to be gauge invariant, but it brings some complications, right? So therefore, whenever we encounter this, we have to choose a convenient reference frame, okay? So to study this story. Now, what is the convenient reference frame in this case? Uh, now, why there is a complication? Because, first of all, we, we not, we, we, when we are investigating gravitational field, the reason why G mu is frame dependent is because precisely there is no absolute notion of, the, of G mu nu, of the gravitational field. Because depending in which reference frame you are, some objects may influence your G mu nu and some objects do not, right? So, for example, in this room, we are experiencing Hubble expansion of the universe. In fact, we are experiencing it enormously. We're experiencing it so much that actually the, the galaxies that are from us at distance 10 to the uh, 50, so approximately 15 million light years, 13, they escape away from us at the velocity larger than the speed of light, okay? So strong is the gravitational influence of the universe. But nevertheless, in this room, we don't, we don't experience this, right? Why? Because in this room, when we talk about gravitational field of the Earth, we choose mentally, automatically, we choose a very convenient reference frame. Now, what is this reference frame? This is the reference frame in which we, together with the source of the interest, in this particular case, is the Earth, are freely falling in the gravitational field produced by the rest of the universe, okay? Therefore, gravitational field of, of, produced by the rest of the universe is not important, okay? Now, in this reference frame, uh, gravitational field produced by the Earth uh, is very close to being Minkowski, flat uh, field, plus a deviation from Minkowski, okay? I can always parameterize it. This is just the definition, okay? I can define it that way. Now, the thing is that um, the, the, the one characteristic, but the, not the only one, but one, one characteristic uh, of how strong is the gravitational field is therefore, when you go, go into this reference frame, how big is delta G mu nu? Now, how big is relative to what? How big is relative to one? Because metric is a dimensionless number, okay? And eta, eta mu nu is one, okay, order one. So therefore, the measure, one measure, not the only measure, so be careful, okay? So uh, is to how big is this compared to one, okay? How small it is compared to one, in fact. In fact, for the Earth, in this reference frame that I've just outlined, um, this guy for the Earth, delta uh, for the Earth, is approximately 10 to the minus 8. Actually, the Newtonian component is 10 to the minus 8, okay? Now, this is very instructive because this is telling us why the gravitational field of the Earth is weak. Of course, we don't think that it's weak because its pretty influences are, are, are pretty much, but it's weak compared to what? It's weak compared to a gravitational field of a black hole. So this is the measure of how far Earth is from being a black hole, okay? We are 10 to the minus 8 away, fortunately, and that's, that's very good, so uh, from being a black hole. So, for example, uh, in the, uh, on the surface of a neutron star, I don't know if somebody can survive there, but if you are there, this will be almost order 1, okay? A little bit small, okay? So, the places in our universe where this delta G okay, in that reference frame, is of order one are black holes, okay? So if you approach, if you go near the black hole horizon in that reference frame that I had outlined, then delta G will become order one. In fact, you can use this as a one test for whether you are dealing with a black hole or, or not, okay? So if you measure this and you see that it's large, then this is, then you are near the black hole. Okay, very good. Now, uh, okay, perfectly fine. Now, what we need to do, we need to understand some dynamics about this field, first classically, then quantum mechanically. And then, which is even more important, to understand where quantum mechanics enters, okay? Because sometimes you can think that you are doing something quantum mechanically, it turns out that it's classical, okay? You're not doing any quantum mechanics in reality, as we'll see in a moment, okay? Now, uh, so in order to understand dynamics of this field, normally we need equations, okay? Now, equations is one thing, but also there is a powerful tool in physics, right, to, uh, to deal with different types of problems, and this is symmetry, okay? In physics, symmetries play a very important role. Why? Because, first of all, they are extremely useful for the bookkeeping, okay? 
Now, um, here, so therefore, let me consider the following situation. Let me completely ignore the rest of the universe. Let's say I have a source, okay, localized uh, at some, in some finite uh, volume, okay, and whenever I go to infinity, there are no sources, therefore, uh, delta G approaches zero. So at infinity, okay, when I go to infinity, uh, my metric approaches the Minkowski, flat Minkowski metric, okay, then in this situation, I can use an extremely powerful tool for characterizing all possible processes that I'm interested in locally. This tool is the Poincare symmetry because this is the symmetry of the asymptotic space. Okay, so then in this space, we will define something that we call uh, an asymptotic observer. So the asymptotic observer is someone that is very far and is, is simply observing processes from far away, so can prepare in states and out states, quantum mechanically send it in and the detect in and out states. And so in asymptotically Minkowski spaces, uh, this observer can uh, parameterize physics by power of, Minko of uh, Poincare symmetry group, okay? Now, everybody knows here what the Poincare symmetry group is, but I will just remind you that also in group theory, there is a powerful way to bookkeep a group theory by Casimir operators, okay? So you can parameterize transformation properties of the fields or particles uh, with respect to the group using, you can label them using Casimir operators. Now, Poincare group has two Casimir operators, the mass and the spin, okay? So therefore, if you give me a mass of a particle and the spin of a particle, Essentially, I know everything I can know within the Poincare symmetry about this particle, okay? So, the gravitational field itself is not an exception. Gravitational field itself transforms definitely in this setup, okay? In asymptotically flat, uh, for asymptotically flat observer. Uh, gra uh, the graviton also transforms as uh, under Poincare group, and it has spin two, so spin two, and mass zero. So these are the two characteristics of, of the graviton, okay? Now, uh, given this, actually, uh, now this is the, probably in this lecture, the first encounter with the power of field theory. First of field theory and then of quantum field theory. Now, because field theory has these properties of uniqueness, okay? For example, there are unique things that you can write down given some symmetries. Okay, so let, let's, let's demonstrate this thing now. So now, I want to understand dynamics of a field, classical or quantum, which transforms under this, which has these transformation properties. Okay, now of course, when I'm talking about the classical field, there is no notion of the mass. Instead, there is a notion of the lowest possible frequency that it can have, okay? Uh, so then I, um, I have to characterize with this. So I have to write down an equation for a, a field or a particle that has spin two and mass zero, okay? Now, in general, okay, the, you would say, oh, the, then I can write down any equation which, has, which acts on this object or, or on this object, okay? Now, let me call, uh, okay, I will, so th throughout the lecture, I will introduce several notations. Uh, so let's keep track of notations. So let's do the following thing. Let's uh, make notation, uh, the variation of the metric, which is a dimensionless quantity. Uh, I don't know why I'm doing it, but let me call it H menu, okay? Okay, it's just to not to carry this delta around, all right? So let me call it H menu. This is, so H menu is a classical dimensionless field, okay? So it's not canonically normalized. Then I will denote the uh, classical canonically normalized field with H bar, okay? Okay, finally, I will denote a quantum graviton field or graviton. Uh, H hat, okay? I don't know if you will remember this mess, but okay. I'm just, uh... Okay, so now I want to write down the equation for this guy, or this guy. Which, uh, uh, ah, there is a button, right? I can move. Okay. Uh, so the equation has the form, which we can write in a moment. Um, now, let me, let me write here in the following way. This is uh, Newton's constant uh, times the energy momentum tensor. 
For this discussion, let me set this Newton's constant to 1 for a moment, OK? So I don't need it. So let me just use this equation. Now, this is so-called Einstein's linearized Einstein tensor, OK? But at the moment, I'm not going to Einstein gravity. I'm just going to the linearized version, OK? The weak field. We are working in the weak field approximation, OK? Now, this guy has the following form. This object has the following form. Uh, this symmetrized, uh, and then okay. This is just the definition of this Einstein tensor. Um, okay, so basically the equation then in, is this is equal to t mu. Okay, so in these units that uh, I. I will restore G Newton in a, in a moment. But. OK, so this equation looks complicated. But the, the, anyway, the first thing you can ask is why this type of, what, what, what is this? I mean, why precisely this type of coefficients in front of the y here minus 1? Why not like plus 5 or plus 25? What, what, what's wrong? Obviously, if I would change coefficients here, I would again get a perfectly nice equation for a, for a field with two indices. OK? It looks perfectly. Poincare covariant, it's a tensor, okay, with uh, 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 two symmetric indices, okay. Now, so the tensor with two symmetric indices would carry generically 10 components, okay. So there would be some 10 components that they would satisfy this equation of motion, okay. Then why are we choosing this very specific form? Well, one way you can say, oh, because this is the form that I recover if I take linearized limit of Einstein gravity. But that's not the reason why I'm choosing it, because that would not be a guideline for me. But I mean, I would say, who cares? Okay. I want to write down a equation for a field with two indices. Why should I stick necessarily to linearized Einstein? Let's explore a landscape, even even bigger, more possibilities. The point is, uh, okay. The point is, that, let me first tell you the answer. The point is that there is a uniqueness story in quant in field theory, in particular in quantum field theory. Okay. That this is the only thing you can write down. You cannot write down anything else. Nothing else would make any sense, okay, if you write down. For, for sure, you can, for example, change this coefficient here, put 25. And from the symmetry properties, the symmetry properties point of view, nothing will change in this equation, okay? This equation will remain for covariance, covariant, perfectly with two indices, and uh, no, no problem. But, um, but this, 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 the, the theory described by this equation as a quantum field theory would stop to make sense, okay? Right? And this is an extremely powerful selection uh, uh, tool coming from quantum field theory. Quantum field theory, and especially gravity, obeys all possible uniqueness requirements. Okay? It's very dangerous to move away from linearized Einstein. If you, write down, if you want to write down a theory which makes sense of a spin-2 particle massless, this would be linearized Einstein. You cannot write down anything else. Now, why? What's the reason for that? Okay? Now, sometimes people say, so first of all, notice that, now, as you, as you also know that the other thing that plays a very uh, powerful role in, in quantum field theory are symmetries, okay? Our gauge is a, is a gauge symmetry, okay, in particular. Now, uh, this uh, theory written in this way, okay, exhibits uh, a, the, a, a gauge symmetry, okay, uh, of the following type. So I can shift my, uh, Gravitational field by a derivative of a vector. Now, um, so we have this very, very psi is an arbitrary vector, okay, space time dependent. Now, if I would change coefficients in this uh, uh, equation, uh, this symmetry will no longer be a symmetry, okay, of the, of the theory. So sometimes people say that uh, you choose this form because you, cho you, you, because you require gauge symmetry. But that's not a good argument because you can ask them, why do you require gauge symmetry? Why do I care? Okay? Let's make these gauge, uh, things gauge non-invariant. So the correct answer is that you cannot write down a theory. You don't have a right in some sense. Uh, or not the right, you have right, but you, if you want to get a sensible theory, it automatically has gauge invariance, and vice versa, okay? 
sorry, not vice versa. You can have a gauge invariant theory, which makes no sense. That's easy, but but um, but the theory that makes sense is automatically gauge invariant. In, in other words, you cannot avoid this this redundancy. So gauge invariance is not a symmetry of the theory; it's a redundancy. Okay. It's a redundancy of the description because you are saying I can describe my my, symmet my theory with the with the field H menu or the shifted field. Okay. Now, what would be wrong if I would depart, depart from this description? Now, unfortunately, I don't have time in these lectures to devote too much discussion about gauge symmetry, which, which is fascinating. Uh, of course, it's, it's it's a fantastic subject. But uh, you can do the following exercise. You, um, you can do uh, you can disbalance some of these terms. Okay, and then investigate what is the theory that you get. And you will necessarily discover that that theory necessarily has consistency problems in the sense that it's no longer a theory of a massless particle with, um, with spin 2. It will be a theory of plus something else. Now, this plus something else typically would have some crazy properties like, for example, complex norm or negative norm. In other words, this theory will not make sense as a consistent quantum theory. Okay? And this is very important. Now. Uh, so I don't have time to do this exercise, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice exercise. You can do it. But so therefore, let me consider this theory. Okay. Uh, if we stick to this theory, what do we do then? Uh, what, what is the next step we need? Right. We need, we need to understand what is the dynamics of this field H menu. Now, H menu is an object that has ten components. Okay. Now, what we want to understand is how many of these components are physical. How many of them are unphysical? How many of them are physical but propagating? And how many are physical but not propagating? Okay? In other words, how many of them can induce waves and this kind of stuff? Now, to do this, um, you can do the following thing. Okay? Let's investigate. Let me put some, some source. And let me investigate how the, the gravitational field responds to the source. Okay? Now, in order to investigate, then what, what I have to do? I have to invert this equation. Right? But this equation is not very nicely invertible. Okay? The form is not, this is not an operator with these indices, mixed indices that you can easily invert. So we have to reduce this, this equation to an invertible form. Now, quantum mechanically, this means that I need to find a graviton propagator. Okay? Now, how do I get to an invertible form? It, actually, it, uh, it is, it is uh, pretty easy, okay? because we can use power of gauge invariance. So what do we do? We do the following thing. First, we fix the gauge. All right? Let me fix the gauge, which the often people use, the donder gauge, where H is the trace. So, by the way, H uh, is simply a trace of, the, of this guy. Okay? If I use this gauge, what will happen is that these two terms will cancel. Uh, this one, um, this one, okay, and then there will be some remaining terms, okay. This will uh, this will convert it. This will get converted into box with a coefficient, okay, and we get certain structure which only depends on the boxes, okay. Now then, what we can, what can we do? We can write down this structure. That will be one half of this, okay. So we'll get uh, box h mu minus one half of eta mu nu. Uh, box H, and this is now T mu nu. And now I can take the trace of this and re express. Let me put this up. So now I can take the trace of this, okay? And therefore I can re express the trace through the trace of T, okay? So in other words, if I take trace of this, what do I get? I get, uh, I get box trace of H minus 2. Right, so I get uh, minus box trace of H, box H is T mu nu, right? Then I can substitute this in this expression by T mu nu and solve it. Uh, T, yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, very good. So then I substitute it back and now I can invert it for H mu nu because now the only term that which remains to be inverted is this one, okay? Everybody is following, right? I'm not going to. Uh, too fast. Otherwise, you just slow me down. Okay? Then the form will be this. Okay, this is very nice. Now, now this is an invertible uh, operator. Okay? 
we can invert it. Now, notice the following thing also. Uh, by choosing the gauge, we um, eliminated uh, four, because this is a condition which depends on, uh, these are four conditions, right? So we, we eliminated four uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, so we had 10, right? Now we have minus four, now we're left with the six degrees of freedom. Now six we can no longer eliminate by using, naively it looks like we cannot eliminate by using gauge freedom, because the, 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 the xi was an arbitrary vector, okay? We used four arbitrary vectors to kill four degrees of freedom, okay? So now what happens with this six, degree of, six degrees of freedom? The point is, however, that we have to distinguish, and so this is what I said, the hierarchy, right? So we, ha we have to distinguish between unphysical degrees of freedom, okay, which are not there, unphysical means they are not there. These are these four that we killed, okay, because uh, they are simply not there. However, you can now again have degrees of freedom which are somehow not, not unphysical necessarily, but not propagating, okay? So in other words, you can kill propagation abilities of the extra degrees of freedom. Now, for this, notice that this gauge freedom will not undo this gauge condition if I do the gauge transformation by xi that satisfies the equation that the, the D'Alembertian of xi vanishes, okay? Okay, so in other words, if uh, xi parameter satisfies this, this here, this satisfies this condition, it behaves like a massless uh, 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 vector, okay? then I can still use transformation properties with this xi, and this will not undo this condition, okay? All right? Now, this is very nice, because then I'm keeping the same condition, so I'm keeping this four degrees of freedom that I had killed, okay? But in addition, now I can use this freedom to kill propagation abilities of another four degrees of freedom. Why? Because the equation is with box. So therefore, I can perform transformation on this guy, if uh, the if xi satisfies this equation box, um, that, that's perfectly fine. I'm not undoing the gauge, and I can use it to kill propagation of four extra degrees of freedom. Okay, so therefore, this kills extra two, extra four. So then we are left with six minus four, two. So we have two propagating degrees of freedom uh, left. Okay. Now the fact that degrees of freedom are not propagating doesn't mean that they are unphysical. They they are simply not propagating means that they cannot produce waves, okay? So, in other words, uh, gravity waves will have two independent polarizations, will have two independent degrees of freedom. Just exactly in the same way, by the way, as electromagnetic waves, okay? From that point of view, graviton and the photon, they both propagate the same number of degrees of freedom, despite the fact that one is a tensor, one is spin two, and one, another one is spin one, okay? This is the point, okay. Now, so then, then the, what is the point? The, 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 po the point is the following. So you give me the source, and I can invert the uh, I can invert this equation. I can tell you what will be the gravitational field produced by that source. Okay, what will be the dis disturbance to the flat matrix produced by the source? Now this is simply so. The answer is that my h mu nu at any point of x will be one over box acting on this guy. Now, one over box acting on this guy means that this is simply an integral operator, right? This is a Green's function. This is simply d for x prime g x minus x prime, uh, the, the propagator acting on t alpha beta, okay? Where this is this type of projector, which gives you this structure, okay? So this is just the Green's function. This Green's function a priori has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. This is, everything is perfectly classical. This is a classical equation. You give me a source, I find the Green's function, I give you a solution from this, uh, created by this, by this source, okay? Now, um, now suppose I want to go one step further, or actually let, let's say I want to go infinite steps further and restore full Einstein theory, okay, in this way, all right? This is linearized. Oh, by the way, this linearized gives you very nice, uh, okay, you can immediately, for example, get Newton's law from here, as you can see, because I can, I can choose a source, 
let's say, which is non-relativistic uh, static source, okay? Either spherically symmetric or even point-like, delta function, let's say, okay, of mass m. And then I take it, plug it here, okay, and I just have to do one over box, which this is simply an inverse of the Lambertian, okay. The corresponding, for example, Newtonian component would be simply, uh, would be simply Rg over R, okay, and so on. Now, uh, here, okay, now there is a time to restore G Newton. Okay, so Juno, restore G Newton should be here. And okay, that's why you, you get here the, the, the gravitational radius, the Schwarzschild radius, okay? All right, Is, any questions so far? About anything, no. Now, let's, that, suppose, okay, now what do you want to do? We want to understand in, in the full glory the nonlinearities, okay? How nonlinearities appear in this language. All right. Now, it, to understand, it turns out that to understand nonlinearities, you can just press on on this road. You can just continue, and you will recover full Einstein. How do you recover full Einstein? Again, there is this power of uniqueness of certain quantum field theories. So, the point is that what this equation is telling you is that by consistency, this the the, the spin two particle is coupled to a source which is an energy momentum tensor. Now, in the linear approximation, what, you, what, what are you doing? You are saying, okay, I have an external source, and I couple graviton to this, uh, gravity to this external source, okay? And it produces some gravitational field. But gravity itself has an energy momentum, energy and momentum, so therefore graviton has a self-coupling. By coupling it, but why? Because it couples to its own energy momentum. Then what, I can, what can I do? I can do the following thing. I can, I can go back and correct this equation by correcting T mu nu by taking into account energy momentum tensor of, of the graviton from the previous order, okay? And I can continue this process forever, okay? Now, continuing this process forever, this means that I'm getting the following structure. Let me write it uh, somewhere. Ah, now I have to move this down. Um, so this means that you are getting, so first of all, this linear action, this corresponding action that gives you this linear equation, the action is, of course, uh, linear action is simply inverse of Newton's constant and uh, and, uh, and H, we call it H, right? H nu epsilon H. Okay, so this is the linear action, okay? This is the action from where, from where I'm getting this equation, um, I mean, without the source. But now I'm in including, uh, and plus, of course, plus the coupling of this, uh, uh, plus the, the coupling to, to the source. Now, when I'm including, when I'm doing iterations, I'm including self-coupling of gravitons. This means that this equation will go, will change in the following way. There will be a cubic interaction of graviton with some complicated tensorial structure, which I, I don't want to uh, write now. First of all, I don't even remember. Uh, so, um, so, cubic structure with two derivatives, okay? And so on, higher order terms, okay? So this will continue forever. Now, I will have infinite number of terms, okay? infinite number of self-couplings, and this theory is fully equivalent of the expansion of Einstein gravity, okay? I will recover step by step, order by order, Einstein gravity. Now, uh, co correspondingly, of course, in every order, you have to take into account these nonlinearities in your equation, and your solutions change. So it's useful to parameterize your solution, okay? Your uh, metric perturbation now, the, the, the metric perturbation, in a series of h mu first order, and so on, okay? Now, what, uh, now, the, when we do expansion in the weak field, okay? So this is a weak field expansion. In other words, this means that h2 is less important, then H, H, uh, H1, H3 is less important, and so on, okay? So there's a 
with field expansion. So now you can ask this question. I mean, in the language of parameters, what is the expansion in we are doing? Okay. Now to understand this, what I have to do, I have to canonically normalize Crowdton. Okay. So far we are classical, right? So I'm canonically normalizing a classical gravitational field. Now canonical normalization means that the kinetic term, because this contains two derivatives, the kinetic term should have uh, one. Okay. The, the, the in front of the kinetic term, I should have one. Okay. The, the, the normalized to one. This this guy. So therefore, what I have to do, I have to rescale Newton's Newtonian constant into h. So h bar, which is a canonically normalized field, okay, therefore will be a square root from the inverse Newton's constant times h. Okay? I mean, with all the mu news. Now, let's watch the dimensionalities, okay? What are the dimensionalities of the canonically normalized bosonic field? Field, classical field, okay? What's the dimensionality? Let's restore the dimensionality because um, if I have a canonically normalized bosonic field, what is the action? Action is d for x, right? And then the field, two derivatives, field, right? So this is telling me in order to match the dimensionality of the action because action has dimensionality. What is the dimensionality of the action? Action. Dimensionality, dimensionality of the action is the same as dimensionality of h bar, by the way, right? So this is mass times the length. Okay? So which means that the canonical dimensionality of the canonically normalized bosonic field, any bosonic field, okay, uh, dimensionality should be square root from m mass divided by the length. Okay? Which is the same as dimensionality of the inverse Newton's constant square root from the inverse Newton's constant. This is the same as dimensionality of the square root from Newton's constant. Mass divided by length. Okay? Now, very good. This means that this guy will disappear from here. It gets rescaled. But of course it will appear in all the terms and will measure the strength of gravitational interaction in nonlinearities. Okay? For example, here we will get G Newton and so on, okay, high, high orders. And from here we remove it, we put bars, and you can go forever, okay, with this, all right? So therefore, for the classical gravitational field, the strength of nonlinearities is measured by the gradient times the Newton's square root from the Newton's constant in each vertex of nonlinearity, okay? Okay, very good, so now, with this technique, I can go, go ahead and give you, in principle, if I'm, if I'm powerful enough or have powerfully enough computer, I can give you a solution of arbitrary uh, classical gravitational field. You give me a source and I give you the solution to, a, to, to any order, okay, in G Newton expansion, okay? For example, let's just, just, just give an example. For example, suppose I have a source, some fixed source, T mu nu, the same fixed source, T mu nu, and I want to take into account nonlinearity here, okay? Now, I want to write this down somewhere that and then I will not erase. So how does it work? This, this I can also use? Or? Yes. But then this moves up, right? Okay, so that's perfect. All right, so then, now, um, you understand what the problem is, right? So I give you a source, T mu nu, and I ask you, find a, at some point, at some point x, gravitational disturbance produced by this source up to the second order, okay, in uh, G Newton. Okay? Okay, that will be simply the following thing, just continuation of that stuff. At any point x will be integral of dx1, dx2, dx3, and then there will be a propagator, a graviton propagator, then will be some complicated vertex structure, okay? This is just a structure, let me call it V, it will depend on the derivatives and nothing, nothing very smart, but some combination of derivatives, okay? We'll have three, three pairs of indices, 
Why? Because they are nonlinear. It's a cubic nonlinearity. Okay. Then gravitational field interacts. Three uh, gravitons. Okay. Will interact. So there, there, there will be some uh, three pairs of indices. Okay. So it will be alpha, beta. Uh, let's say gamma, delta, and rho, kappa. And then, because this is an intermediate vertex, okay, there will be merging of three Green's functions. Okay? Uh, so there will be Green's function, gamma delta AB, x1. Uh, so this will be at the point x1, where the vertex happens, x1 minus x, uh, uh, x1 minus x2. There will be another one, G. Uh, uh, rho kappa uh, CD X1 minus X3 and convoluted with the sources. So you will have T uh, AB at point X2 and T CD and point X3. Okay, this is the answer. So diagrammatically, I can express this diagrammatically. Uh, Let me see here. Diagrammatically, what is this? So this is second order, okay? What happened? So I'm looking at the gravitational field created at point X, but I'm looking for a process when gravitons happen to interact nonlinearly. Okay, so this is uh, AB and this is CD. This is at point x2, this is at point x3, and this happened at point x1, okay? And here I'm finding the gravitational field at point x, okay? This is the process. In other words, you can understand this expression diagrammatically, simply, okay? This means that I took into account the trilinear interaction between the gravitons, okay? So this will create correction to the linear solution to, I mean, linearized Einstein gravity, the first nonlinear solution will come from this type of processes. Now, uh, let me tell you that this vertex has been experimentally measured. We know that this exists, okay? It's real. This is not some imagination of theoretical physicists. Why? Because this is what is responsible for the mercury, mer perihelion precession of mercury, okay? This is precisely diagrammatically expressed correction to the linearized gravity coming from nonlinearities, the first leading nonlinearities in Einstein theory, okay? So, it, therefore, everything here is absolutely real and even experimentally measured, okay? By the way, everything is classical so far, okay? And this is the important thing. Now, uh, okay, um, of course, this, as you can see very easily, there are how many powers of, of G Newton? So, the, the G Newton enters. Uh, of course, there is a G Newton square root from G Newton here in the vertex, and then there is a coupling to, uh, from square root of G Newtons here with the sources. Okay, so this is the order G Newton cubed, G square root of G Newton cubed. This 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 diagram appears in that order. Okay. Now, of course, if this is in the expression for the gravitational field, h mu nu. Now I know what is h mu nu, let's say at point x. Let's say in this room, okay? We know what is h mu nu produced by the gravitational field of the sun at this point, okay? Now in order to understand the effect of this gravitational field at myself, I have to call modules this gravitational field with the energy momentum tensor of myself. I am a probe, okay? And of course, I have to multiply it with another square root from G Newton's, con Newton's constant, okay? So this means that I have to convolute this now with another source, let me call it tau time, time, time mu, okay? And of course, there is extra price to pay, this is square root from G Newton. So that the entire process, entire process will be correction G Newton square, okay? Okay, very good. So now, classically, we can press on and reconstruct the entire GR in this way. Okay, it's, uh, for, for this expansion, of course, it's important that I am outside of the Schwarzschild radius, okay? Uh, if I'm inside of the Schwarzschild radius, this means that if I want to continue the same story in the interior of a black hole, 
it's a little bit more complicated. I have to resum series because the expansion parameter there is no longer G Newton, as we will also understand quantum mechanically. But for a moment, okay, let's not go there. Okay, any, any questions about this so far? Yeah. No, so far I told you, you see, this is a very good question you are, you are asking. Let me just move this. Uh, Okay, and then this. Now, the question was whether I have to take into account all possible loops, right? Out here. Why there was this question? Because since I draw this with something that probably you recall the Feynman diagram, you thought there must be loops because Feynman, Feynman diagram is quantum. This is why I wrote this diagram in the last moment because I didn't want to write it down. Because if I would not show you that picture, you will never ask me about the loops because this is a purely classical expression. We are in classical physics. This is the important thing, OK? The, and this is the most important thing to understand. One of the confusions that people are sometimes having, OK, is w when we are in the classical regime and when we are in the quantum. Now, despite the fact that I can understand everything in the language of Feynman diagrams, this process is purely classical. This is fully equivalent of solving classical equation of motion, uh, classical Einstein equation of motion, OK? There is no quantum information here. H bar is 0, OK? right? Now let's precisely try, let's try to understand what is happening, okay? How come I'm, draw, I'm drawing a Feynman diagram and yet I'm getting to something that we, which is classical, right? This is, this is, the, this is the point. So I, I was going there anyway, so let's now try to understand what is happening. Uh, okay, so now let's ask the following question. What quantum mechanics brings to this story, okay? What is new that quantum, mechanic brings, quantum mechanics brings, okay? Now, quantum mechanics is telling us that instead of the field at some given point, instead of thinking in the way that I have a source, and this source created a field at some point x, and then this field acts on some other sources, quantum mechanics is telling us that I can understand the, 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 the effect as an exchange of a virtual particle. Okay? So in other words, quantum mechanically, this process when two sources interact, t mu nu and the probe, let's say, I can understand as an exchange of a virtual particle, a graviton, okay? This is the, uh, this is the, 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 the new way in which quantum mechanics is viewing exactly the same physics, okay? Now, what is graviton? Let's try to understand how the graviton is related with uh, the gravitational field. Now, Graviton is the quantum of the gravitational field, okay? What is the dictionary? The, the dictionary is the following. Whenever I have a canonically normalized uh, classical gravitational field, in the language of gravitons, this will be, and this is very important, uh, this is independent of the situation. Always, whatever situation you have, classical gravitational field will be the square root from h bar, Okay, some factors which I don't care about, okay, some normalization factors which, which you can choose. But there will be square root of h bar and then a quantum operator, okay? Now, this quantum operator, you can normalize it to be dimensionless, for example, right? What is important is that this operator measures, uh, well, me not necessarily measures, but it has to do with the occupation number of quanta, okay? This is the operator which contains necessarily something that acting on the vacuum gives you a particle or something that acting on a particle gives you a vacuum, okay? Creates or destroys particles, okay? This is unavoidable, okay? No matter what way you want to introduce quantum gravity, you cannot avoid this, okay? There will be notion, the classical notion will be recovered as a square root from h bar times something which has to do with occupation numbers, okay? Occupation numbers of quantum particles, okay? In this particular, of course, in this particular case, these are gravitons. This is, by the way, true also in, for the quantum electrodynamics. The, the, there, is, there is nothing fundamentally different in, in this respect, okay? Now, this means the following, right? Now, let's, let's press on. Now, before I knew that gravitational field was acting, was coupled, gra gravitational field, this guy was coupled to the energy momentum tensor, through the square root uh, of Newton's constant, okay? 
Now, this dictionary is telling me that this quantum entity, which I will call graviton, okay, naturally, okay, is coupled to the same energy momentum source through the following thing, h bar, Newton's constant, and then, okay, now, this is an extremely important quantity, okay, of nature, right, it could be even most important quantity of nature, okay, what is it? Let's investigate this quantity. This quantity is uh, the square root from uh, the, uh, from Newton's, uh, from h bar times Newton's constant. This quantity has dimensionality of the length, okay? And we call it a Planck length, okay? So this is the Planck, famous Planck length. And this is the quantum length scale of gravity. Now, the quantum, uh, the Planck length has many equivalent meanings, okay? You can look from different points of view. One we just uncovered, because we see immediately that the meaning of the Planck length is that the graviton, canonically normalized, uh, up to, I'm talking about dimensionalities, I don't care about numbers over the one, pi and four pi and whatever. The way this couples to the energy momentum tensor, the strength is measured by the Planck, uh, Planck length. In other words, the uh, quantity, okay, that controls the strength of the gravitational interactions is energy times the Planck length, okay? Or, to be more precise, uh, okay, we'll define it, it more precisely in a moment, okay? So this is what we are uncovering. Now, therefore, this process, for example, that we obtained uh, by solving the classical equation of motion, okay? This integral that I wrote there, this is exactly the integral you will get if you compute this exchange qu fully quantum mechanically, if you compute exchange between two sources by, by a graviton. You will end up with exactly the same integral. Why? Because all the powers of h bar cancel out. Okay? Because I multiply in, the, in, this, in this computation, every time I, multiply, I, I express something through h bar, I also have h bar in the denominator, so they cancel out. That's not surprising because I told you that the Previous computation was classical, so therefore, this is a quantum computation which recovers the classical limit, okay? Now, <clears throat> let's ask this for the following question, okay? How can it be that the quantum computation recovers the classical limit, right? Right, now, the classical limit, in order for something to recover classical limit, I told you that there is a, okay, I don't know, how, how much time do I have, by the way? Nothing, right? Half an hour. Ah, still half an hour, oh, great, great, fantastic. So, because, uh, okay, I was, uh, I was hurrying a little bit. Okay, the point is the following, okay, let me tell you the answer and we'll come back to this. So, the point is the following, the way you can think about it, because it's true that the, it's true that the, uh, the, the force is mediated by, this process is mediated by exchange of gravitons. That is true. But those gravitons are virtual, okay? Now, uh, virtual gravitons, what does it mean that they are virtual? This, this means that you cannot really detect them. They, this is not a process which is happening in any well-defined moment of time or space, okay? These are virtual. <clears throat> What's their number? How many of them you exchange? Their number is infinite, okay? And precisely because their number is infinite, because they are virtual, you cannot detect them. There is no number to them, okay? That's why they, what their action is effectively equivalent to a classical process. Now, this will no longer be true, okay, if I would include loops. There was this question about loops, okay? So, for example, of course, this is what, what, whatever I said, this is true about the processes which, in which, okay, the following things, in which gravitons only end on classical sources. So, in other words, you don't have production of gravitons in the final state. You don't have propagating gravitons in the final state. They are all virtual. And these external sources are classical, okay? Then this is true. Then any such a process you can recover from seemingly quantum mechanical computation, but they are equivalent, okay? But, for example, if I would be interested in the following process in which I will also create gravitons on the way, something like this, I don't know, then of course this is no longer true. This I cannot account by classical computation because this contains extra powers of h-bar 
and extra occupation numbers which are finite. Right? Because I can produce like, let's say I produce two gravitons, these are two. Two gravitons is not a classical notion. Okay? This is very important. So, and the loops. The loops is the same thing because if I have loops of gravitons, okay, I don't know, these all, all possible things, okay, then, then the powers of H, H bar, they are not matched. And so the, I, the, this is an expansion in H bar. So, therefore, to summarize, what are we understanding? We're understanding the following thing, that what, when we go from classical to quantum, surprisingly enough, there is a subclass of quantum processes which recovers classical physics, okay? But there is another subclass which does not recover classical physics. In general, there is a, the following dictionary, okay? Now, this is not a theorem, but there is a, it seems to be the following dictionary. That in all the situations in which, well, not in all the situations, but at least there are some well-defined situations in which you have processes in which occupation numbers are very large, then such processes, could either, either for virtual particles or real particles, then such processes, they are approximate, approximately classical, okay? This is not true always, but it's true in some well-defined class of situations, okay? Okay, now, let's go to the, um, uh, let's continue with this. Oh, no, this is. Okay. Now let's try to understand what, uh, what is the nature of gravitons. Because to, in order to understand quantum gravity, we have to understand what the gravitons are. For example, how, they, how strongly they interact with each other, what, is the, what are their quantum properties, and so on. Now, I introduced the notion of the Planck length. Okay? As I said, this is, the, this is a very important scale. Now, let me, we can also introduce a notion of the Planck mass, which is simply uh, an inverse of the Planck length. Okay? Now, um, what happens when h bar goes to zero? If I keep all, everything else fixed and I take h bar to zero, then notice that Planck length goes to zero, but also Planck mass goes to zero, right? So they both go to zero. Now, the numerical values of the Planck mass. Oh, sorry. Now the Planck length in, in real physics, the Planck length is approximately 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, okay? This is an extremely small uh, length scale, but it's not infinitely small. That's why quantum gravity is important, okay? Now, in a sense, we are sort of fortunate that uh, this scale is not zero, but small, because if it were exactly zero, we would not have any pro anything from quantum gravity. Uh, if it were, Large would be okay. We will not have nice, nice classical gravity that we enjoy. So okay. So, so this is a, to me it's at the right place. Okay. Now the the Planck mass is approximately 10 to the 19 GV, or 10 to the minus 5 grams. So by the way, this is the mass of the biological cell. I think the if you have the you have this amoeba, the one cell organism. Okay, that's precisely the, the, the mass. Of course, it's a very large mass for the, for the point of view of uh, particle physics, okay? And, okay, we will reiterate it, this, this very carefully. Now, as I said, now, what are the meanings of the Planck scale and Planck mass? As I said, they have several, diff several meanings. Finally, at the end of the day, these meanings are equivalent, okay? But for example, you can say that Planck length is the length scale for which the gravitons become strongly coupled, okay? Planck mass is the energy scale per graviton where they become strongly coupled. Uh, Planck length is the size of a smallest black hole that you can have in nature, and the Planck mass is the mass of a smallest black hole that you can have in nature, okay? Uh, in fact, it, it, there are very strong arguments indicating that not only that Planck length is the smallest size of a smallest black hole, but it's also a simply a smallest scale, length scale of nature that you can experimentally probe, okay? In principle, I'm, saying, I'm not saying in practice. In practice, of course, it's very hard, but even in principle, in other words, no matter how advanced our civilization will become, uh, we will be ne we'll never be able to probe uh, sub distances, okay? And the reason for that are black holes. 
as, we, as, I, as I will try to explain. Okay, so then let's try to now understand uh, quantum properties of gravitons. Uh, now, in quantum field theory, usually it's very convenient to parameterize the strength of the interaction, okay, with certain dimensionless number, okay, um, the number or quantity. Typically, we call it alpha, right? So, for, for example, for electromagnetic interaction, this alpha is like one approximately 137, right? So the question is, what is the analogous thing for gravity? So what is alpha gravity? Let's try to figure this out, okay? Now, first of all, why we like dimensionless quantities when we deal with, um, with uh, strength of the interactions, okay? Of course, one way you can say we always measure dimensionless quantities because we always measure ratios. But also here, uh, there is another side to it because this quantity is typically what measures the amplitude of probability of scattering, okay? Since probability is dimensionless, so it's natural to use dimensionless number. Now, what does it mean uh, of scattering? The point is that gravitons, they interact with each other, right? And they interact with each other, and so as a result of this interaction, let's say I can have initial, in initial state, let's say I, have, I can have two gravitons, and I can have two gravitons in the final state, all right? And with certain probability, the gravitons in the final state can have different momenta as the ones in the initial state, okay? When this happens, we say that gravitons scatter. So we want to know what is the scattering probability in a given situation, okay? So that's why it's useful to parameterize by dimensionless number alpha. Now, what is alpha for gravity? Um, alpha for gravity, you can uh, figure, it out, figure it out in many different ways, but okay, I mean, the simplest, uh, the most straightforward way is through the coupling of the graviton, okay? Basically, the point is we want to understand how graviton couples to its own energy, okay? This is what, what alpha measures, okay? Now, what is the energy of the graviton? If I have a graviton of wavelength L, the corresponding energy of the graviton is H bar divided by L. This is, um, so this is the energy that, that, that graviton will see, okay? So therefore, graviton couples to this energy with Newtonian strength. As a result, okay, alpha gravity, with Newton's constant strength, not Newtonian strength. Alpha gravity is h bar times g Newton divided by L square. So in other words, what is, what is this expression? This expression is, is telling you, also you can interpret in this way, very crudely, but it actually works very nicely because think of a, simply think about two gravitons and suppose you want to measure Newtonian force, the Newtonian potential between two gravitons. Or, Equivalently, a Newtonian potential created by a single graviton. Of course, it's not truly Newtonian because graviton is uh, non-relativistic, but what, what I'm saying Newtonian, I mean that, okay? The linearized uh, potential created by the graviton. So, that will be as if graviton has energy, uh, h bar over L, times Newton's constant, times the distance, okay? This is the same thing, okay, times one, of the, one over the distance. So, this is what we get, okay? Now, notice that I can rewrite this as L Planck divided by L square. Now, this is very instructive because this is telling you that uh, the gravitons of long wavelengths, they interact weaker. So the strength of the graviton interaction is measured by how long is the wavelength of the graviton relative to the Planck length. That's why when I said that this is the Planck scale, is the scale where gravity becomes strongly coupled, this is what I meant. In other words, gravitons of wavelength L Planck, they become strongly interacting. Strongly interacting are any, in quantum field theories in which alpha becomes one, we call strongly interacting. Why? Because alpha cannot become larger than one. If it becomes larger than one, it loses the meaning of probability. 
This means that probability computed by from that alpha as an expansion in alpha cannot be trusted. So this is the this is the scale where gravity enters the in the strong coupling regime. This is the Planck length. Okay. Now what happens beyond? In order to understand what happens beyond, we have to convolute this information with the knowledge about black holes. And not just knowledge about black holes, we also have to know what the black holes are quantum mechanically. Okay. But before going there, let's for fun. Now now why why I'm bringing this up? Well, I'm bringing this up because we need it. But uh, the point is the following. This also illustrates you. Pro you probably heard many times these words that we don't understand quantum gravity and this kind of stuff. And th this is a basically this, this is a misconception because uh, when we say that we, when people say that we don't understand quantum gravity, the only meaningful statement is that we have problems of understanding quantum gravity at the Planck length wavelengths. But for gravitons whose wavelengths are much lower than the Planck length. Quantum gravity is beautiful theory. It's much nicer than, than any other theory is stronger coupled than gravity. Okay? For example, let's, let's illustrate the point, right? Suppose I want to compute uh, graviton graviton scattering of two gravitons of one centimeter wavelength. Okay? So I have two gravitons of one centimeter wavelength. I want to compute the probability of scattering. Okay? Sc scattering rate, let's say. I want to uh, estimate okay, how long does it take for them to scatter. Now, most of the time, they don't see each other. Why? Because alpha for one centimeter will be this, and this is something like 10 to the minus 66, right? Because the Planck length is like 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So two gravitons of one centimeter wavelength, they interact incredibly weakly, 10 to the minus 66. Now, what will be the rate of the scattering? OK, let's say I have. You, you design an apparatus, you have create flux of gravitons, so one centimeter wavelength, and I want to sit down and wait and see how long I have to wait for them to scatter, okay? The scattering rate will be, it's very easy to estimate, because this will be, the process is uh, through one graviton exchange is, is dominating because the others are suppressed. I'm not considering loops. This will go like alpha square times the characteristic the momentum transfer, characteristic wavelength in, your, in the theory, OK? So this will go like 1 over L. Now, this would be 10 to the uh, minus uh, 132, right? Minus 132 times an inverse centimeter, OK? So this will be the scattering rate. So in other words, the scattering time will be, will be tau will be uh, 10 to the 132 centimeters. Now, 10 to the 132 centimeters, let's convert them into the into something, into the time scale. So the size of the universe is 10 to the 28 centimeters. Sorry, yeah, 10 to the 28 centimeters. So the, 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 the Hubble radius, OK, uh, of the universe is 10 to the 28 centimeters. And this is approximately 10 to the 10. 10 to the 10 years, right? OK, like 10 billion light years. So therefore, we can use this. And this would be 10 to the 114 or something like that. 114 years. Now, this long, you have to wait for these gravitons to scatter. Now, if you think about this, this is really incredible. Because this means that most of the gravitons in our universe, long wavelength gravitons, will not scatter, not just within our lifetime, within lifetime of the universe. They will simply not scatter, OK? Now, this is why the classical gravity is a, such a good approximation, OK? Also, uh, that's why we can trust classical gravity. It, it, it gives us extremely accurate description, OK, of the processes. Another example I can give you, for example, you can ask this question. Um, how long will it take to excite a single graviton in the gravitational field of the Earth if I smash uh, moon at the Earth, for example, OK? And uh, the, the number is, OK, it's not that long, but it's, 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 it's pretty long. It's, it's, again, much longer than the lifetime, life of the universe, uh, lifetime of the universe, OK? So that's why the, uh, since the, the, the quantum gravity is so weak, that's why approximately gravitational field of the planets and Earth and so on is approximately classical, and it's a good approximation. But this turns out to break down for black holes. Why? 
Because for black holes, as we will see, the corresponding alpha of gravity is such that it's always compensated by the occupation number of gravitons. Okay? So we'll, we'll discuss that. All right. Okay, any questions before I continue? Yeah. I thought I, I, I demonstrated it. Yeah, yeah. Nobody claims that it's wrong. You see, let's, this is precisely the point. Because when, when I said there are certain issues, we want to very clearly understand what are the issues. Okay? Now, for example, Fermi theory is also not renormalizable. But you can describe radio radioactive decays extremely nicely with Fermi theory. So the fact that theory is not normalizable doesn't mean that you cannot compute processes using that theory. That's, I just illustrated that you can compute mercury perihelion precession using rules of quantum gravity, okay, extremely reliably, despite the fact that it's not a renormalizable theory. I mean, not, not being renormalizable is not a disaster. We don't have to punish every theory that's not renormalizable, okay? And now, non-renormalizability, on the other hand, is, is a very strong indication that whatever is the theory that takes care of the Planckian processes, okay, of, of the domain of the theory when the wavelength becomes Planckian, so that theory cannot be, uh, can, which must be finite, okay? It, can, it cannot simply be a renormalizable theory. It has to be a finite theory, okay? Now, in this discussion, so this is again connected with the discussion in particular, what happens with the loops of gravitons, right? what happens with all possible loop, loop corrections. So this is a question of, so these are the quest, two different questions. In other words, the question of quantum gravity and question of ultraviolet completion of gravity at the Planck scale, these are two separate questions. In general, fortunately, we can separate them. If we could not, the, the nature would be un, un, not, not understandable for us. We are extremely fortunate. This is the reason why we discovered Newton's law, I mean, Newton discovered Einstein's theory and so on, because of this property that at low energies, gravity is an extremely weak theory. So we can use it as an effective description, effective quantum description, okay? This is very important. Now, of course, there is a question of ultraviolet completion, okay, which is very important, okay? This could be um, the loops, uh, I mean, can be taken, uh, taken care by string theory, okay? There are even investigations whether supergravity theories could be finite. I, I don't know up to whatever number of loops and so on. But of course, that's a very important question on its own. Okay? But what I want to make clear is that these are two separate questions. Okay? Of course, at the end of the day, deep down they are related. Because you know that the same, it's the same part of the two parts of the same theory. But we can address them separately. Okay? And this is uh, very important. Now, let's go to black holes. Okay? Now, black holes classically uh, have a, a lot of fascinating properties, okay? Now, of course, I, I don't have time to review all of them, but they are also classically, already classically, they exhibit some properties which are mysterious if you think about them as a limit of a quantum theory, okay? For example, what is the... Uh, um, Now, let me explain one of these properties. Now, black holes obey so-called uh, no, um, no hair theorems, okay? So in other words, um, these are extremely well understood in the domain of applicability. So for classical black holes, you can prove them, certain theorems. And you can prove in certain classes of theories, rigorously, that black hole has only few characteristics, okay? So black hole can be characterized by its mass, the, uh, the angular momentum and the charge, electric charge, and plus may, there may be some other exotic charges. Okay. Now, this is a rigorous statement in classical physics. Okay, now why this is mysterious? Uh, by the way, I don't know if Rami had a lecture this morning. He, you, you, you discussed something about entropy or stuff, but anyway, let me uh, probably. My, my is, you did not. Very nice. So I have plenty of room now to, <laughs> to improvise. <laughs> okay. 
Now, now this is very important because look, think a bit about the following thing. Why is it so surprising to have a system, a classical system, which has only two, only three or two features? Now, this this property is telling you that black holes are featureless. Okay. Now, normally, to characterize an object, you need enormous number of features. For example, to characterize this, I need enormous number of features. For black holes, it seems that I can get away with three. Okay, you say, well, after all, what's the problem? I mean, you can be, that's perfectly fine, but black holes are like that. So, if you are only living in, within classical domain, then, okay, you can swallow it. You can say, oh, this is very strange, but so what? I mean, they are special. They are like Malevich's square, this, uh, uh, that has no characteristics and uh, no features, no problem. Now, however, the puzzle really appears when you think about black holes as a limit of, uh, from quantum to classical. Now, why? Why is this the case? Now, suppose I want to send you an information, okay? Right? I want to send you a message. I, and let's say we, we want to exchange information through some field, okay? Let's, let's see what we do when we talk about the phone, right? We exchange information. So, how do I send you a message? I encode the message in electromagnetic waves, right? That's what I do. Now, imagine that I want to encode a message. So, how do I encode the message? I put together many photons, right? Because that's what electromagnetic waves are. Now, if I want to send you, imagine that I want to send you an extremely uh, high information message, with extremely uh, big amount of information, a huge number of gigabits, but very short, okay? What do I have to do? Of course, I have to use very short wavelength photons, okay? So I have to use very short wavelength, and I have to use many of them, okay? Because to, to encode, to, to have features, one photon of wavelength L is not having that many features. Maybe I can send you zero or one. So I have to superimpose photons with approximately this wavelength, okay? But a lot of them, bunch of them. So I need large N and short L. However, large N and short L, they cost quantum mechanical energy. Quantum mechanics is telling us that the photon of the wavelength L costs energy. So therefore, the energy of your message will go as N times H bar over L. You cannot avoid this. This is unavoidable, okay? So, in a real world, if I want to send you a message, <coughs> I have to pay, pay price, energy price. We even pay normal price. That's why, because uh, it, it's costly. Um, and so, we'll co to send you a big message will cost energy. Okay? Now, what happens in classical physics? In classical physics, h bar goes to zero. So, the cost of the message goes to zero. In classical physics, I can send you a message which contains an arbitrary amount of information and costs nothing, okay? What does it mean? It, it's, it's very simple because in classical physics, I can create a pulse which will contain arbitrary amount of features or very short wavelength, okay? Very small amplitude. <coughs> costs nothing, okay? So, the normal intuition, if you think about it, is that classical systems should be capable of having infinite number of features. That's what classicality means. Classicality means that you can have infinite information at no cost. Okay? Now, black holes, instead, these no hair theorems are telling us that black holes cannot have that. They have zero. Okay? This is one surprise. Okay, now, this surprise we could still swallow, maybe. I don't know. For me, it would be hard, but maybe, okay, someone could. Uh, that, okay, after all, black holes are exceptional, if, although the other classical configurations can encode infinite number of amount of message, black holes are very special. But, there is one fact which, which completely abolishes this way of thinking, and this is so-called Bekenstein entropy of black holes. Hawking-Bekenstein entropy. Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Okay? Now, what is it? Now, Bekenstein showed that black holes carry entropy, let me call it N for a moment, okay? And this entropy, okay, let me call it S, doesn't matter. And this entropy is proportional to the area of a black hole, okay? To the area, but because entropy is dimensionless, the proportionality coefficient is the Planck length. So, Bekenstein showed that black holes carry entropy 
which is measured as the number of Planckian units, cells, on the, on the, of the area. Okay? Now, this is the fact. Okay? This fact is extremely hard to undo or avoid. Now, the question is, how can you reconcile this fact with this property if I think about classical mechanics as a limit of quantum mechanics when h bar goes to zero? The point is that when h bar goes to zero, the entropy goes to infinity. Because I can take a finite size black hole. As I told you, the Schwarzschild radius is independent of h bar. But Planck length goes to zero. So therefore, the Bekenstein entropy is telling us that black holes should have infinite amount of features. Okay. Whereas no here theorem is telling us the black holes are featureless. So what is this? What is the answer? Is it zero or infinity? Which one is the correct answer? Okay. So now having infinite entropy means that you can store infinite amount of information because entropy is the measure of the capacity of information storage. Okay, it measures micro degeneracy of states. So you can measure it. So you can store infinite amount of information. And the question is how these two are reconciled. Okay, now, in order to understand how these two are reconciled, while staying in the semi-classical physics is impossible. Okay? You need a theory about black hole microstructure. Okay? Without that theory, this can be a wrong theory or right theory, but you need a theory. Okay? Otherwise, this question is simply not addressable within the semi-classical framework. Okay? If you think about black hole as some kind of uniform substance, which you cannot resolve, this question you cannot answer. Now, this is what we're going to try to uh, continue uh, the next lecture. Now, let me tell you the answer. What is the answer? The answer is actually both of these are correct. Okay. So both zero and infinity are correct. Now, how, how can this be the case? Okay. How can it carry zero or infinity? It has to be one. By the way. With zero and infinity, you know that these things sometimes <laughs> are the same, right? <laughs> right. So now, the point is the following, OK? I don't know. I have three minutes. Let me explain very briefly. OK, so what is Bekenstein telling you? Bekenstein is telling you that black holes in the classical limit should store infinite amount of information. But Bekenstein is not telling you how easy it is to retrieve the information, how long you have to wait, OK? So. Uh, on the other hand, in classical, no, here theorem is simply telling you that because black holes are featureless, uh, within any finite time, you cannot retrieve any information. It has no features. So the reconciliation of the two is the following. The, what happens is that when you go from quantum to classical, the information retrieval time goes to infinity. Okay, so there is a time scale involved. And so both are correct. In other words, the time scale of information retrieval goes to infinity. Time scale of information retrieval actually scales as entropy itself. So you have more information, but it's more time consuming to decode in or retrieve this information. So if you want to retrieve information from the, from the uh, classical black hole, you have to sign up for an infinite waiting time list, and then wait there, and then we'll, you will never retrieve it. Okay? This is the reconciliation of the two, and we'll tr try to understand how this is happening. Okay, in the next lecture. So now, yeah, I don't know, I still have one minute, but I don't know what to say. So anyway, any questions? Yeah. Classical black hole, if h bar is zero, can have arbitrary mass, but no problem. No, no, I mean, you, you, even, even for a fixed mass, you, the information you can store in a one black hole, a classical black hole is infinite. Even for a fixed mass. But you want to store information in the mass. No, that's more imaginative, but no, no, that's more imaginative. By the way, this is an interesting question. For example, whether I can send you a message by using a, co a parameter which is continuous, right? Because I can, say, I can attune this parameter very accurately to some whatever decimal, right? And then send you and you decode it up to some decimal. This is not what I'm talking about. This is not information stored in the amount of the mass. This is you fix the black hole and this is the amount of information it can have. It's not the information that you retrieve because you measure the mass of a black hole. No, no, this is not that information. No. That's right. Although you could use it as a message probably. 
Yeah, yeah, sure, but that's the, that, that's not the, the information I'm talking about. Yeah. But then, what about the liberation of black holes? That takes a long time, but it's fine. No, no, it, he, no. In classical limit is infinite. Of course, that's the whole point. Because in classical, not only in classical limit. Uh, uh, by the way, we'll discuss this in, in the next lecture. The the the, the Hawking evaporation of the black hole. Um, so there is a halfway. So we are in the classical world, then we are going to the quantum, right? So we are in the halfway, and this is called semi-classical approximation. Now, what is semi-classical approximation? Semi-classical approximation is when you treat geometry as classical, but you still allow some quantum particles to dance in this geometry, but you ignore the back reaction to geometry. Okay? This is approximation which we call semi-classical. Now, in black holes, this evaporation computation has been done precisely in semi-classical limit by Hawking. Now, how he achieved the semi-classical limit? For black hole to achieve semi-classical limit, you need to do the following thing. One possibility, of course, is to, to take h going to zero, but you don't want that. You want h to be fi uh, finite. Then, the only possibility for black hole to be semi-classical is you have to take mass of a black hole to infinity. Simultaneously, you have to take Newton's constant to zero. But keep the Schwarzschild radius fixed, OK? Non-zero and fixed, OK? This is, the, this is the computation. This is the limit in which Hawking did the computation. And in that limit, he recovered that the, 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 the radiation is thermal. But people forget very often that in this limit, black hole doesn't evaporate. It's infinitely long-lived because it's infinitely massive. Infinitely massive black hole can evaporate, can, can radiate. He had the infinite capacity to radiate will never give you any information back because there is always infinite amount left, OK? This is fully consistent with the fact that information retrieval time goes as entropy, the so-called uh, pages time, which is halfway for, of the black hole evaporation. But halfway for semi-classical black hole evaporation is infinity. So this is perfectly consistent that Hawking radiation is exactly thermal. There is absolutely no paradox with it. Paradox is coming from the confusion of physicists that take this computation and precisely transfer it to a quantum domain. Of course, if I continue to believe that truly quantum black hole radiates exactly thermally, of course I will get a paradox. But, but I mean, why, why, this is inconsistent. How should I believe that? Right. Other questions? <laughs>